Throughout all of college football, there is no other setting that can match that of Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge. The noise, the hot, sticky humidity of the Louisiana Bayou, and the ghost of LSU legends all torment Tiger opponents. For them, this place so dear to Tiger fans indeed does become Death Valley. For 100 years, LSU fans have witnessed countless magic moments. Many that have defined the very essence of college football. Billy Cannon watches it bounce. He takes it on his own 11. He comes back up field at the 15. Stumbles momentarily. He's at the 20. Running hard at the 25. Gets away from the man to the They're at the 25. The game over. Jones back to throw. Looking for a receiver. He has Davis. It is good. Oh, oh, oh. LSU has been blessed with a century of success. It has been filled with moments of great courage and unwavering character that resulted in hundreds of breathtaking victories. These are golden moments in Tigerland. Hi, I'm Ron Franklin. You know, over the years, I've had the good fortune to witness a number of big LSU ball games, many of them right here in the stadium. And probably the thought that I would take away every time I had been here was that the mortar and that the steel in this old stadium is still reverberating from some of those nighttime clashes before sellout crowds. But I think if we were silent right now, and there was one echo that would be remembered by not only me, but everybody in this Bayou State, we'd go back to Halloween night, 1959. It was a showdown between two undefeated SEC powerhouses and two very bitter rivals, LSU and the Ole Miss Rebels. Tickets were at such a premium in the 67,500 seat stadium that one man offered a used Cadillac for four seats. One guy even ventured to swap his wife. LSU was ranked number one, Ole Miss number three. Each team had allowed only one touchdown in the seven previous games of 1959. Ole Miss managed a field goal in the first quarter, but both defenses were suffocating. It appeared that neither team was destined to score a six-pointer that all hallows eve. That's when Billy Cannon took destiny into his own hands. Ole Miss, he stands on his own 28. He gets a pass from center. He boots it and gets another nice kick away going way downfield. Billy Cannon watches it bounce. He takes it on his own 11. He comes back up field at the 15. Stumbles momentarily. He's at the 20. Running hard at the 25. Gets away from one man for 30. They're running the 25. At the 35 or 25. He's down to 50. He's in the 50. 45. 40. In the 10 to 5. He scores. some 89 yards for a touchdown. Listen to the cheer for Billy Cannon as he comes off the field. Great all merit. The run gave the Tigers six points and the victory. It also helped Billy Cannon lock up the Heisman Trophy. If there's one play that symbolizes the spirit of LSU football, it's the punt return where a cannon streaked across the field. LSU led 7-3, to three, but many have forgotten that there were still 10 minutes remaining in the game. Ultimately, a dramatic goal line stand saved the game for the Tigers. 
On fourth down, Ole Miss was about to score. But who else but Billy Cannon made the hit that assured an LSU victory? Although the Halloween Night Class 59 is perhaps the most famous game in LSU history, it was certainly not the Tigers' first golden moment. In 1893, the Bengals began their first and longest lasting rivalry by meeting Tulane in the first game in the history of LSU football. Over the years, these two foes have battled over recruits, bragging rights, and national recognition. But in 1937, they battled over a pair of pants. You see, at the game's coin toss, LSU halfback Pinky Rome made an agreement with the Tulane captain. The winner of the game would cut the seat out of the opposing captain's pants. After the 20 to nothing Tiger victory, Rome made good on the bet. He snipped the pants and a tradition was born. This evolved into the rag, a flag decorated with both LSU's and Tulane's colors. The tradition of night football in Baton Rouge got its start on October the 3rd, 1931. In the first game ever played under the lights, LSU defeated Spring Hill 35 to nothing on the strength of the running of halfback Art Foley. Ironically, it was the only game Foley ever played for the Tigers. It wasn't easy playing football in those days. Even bowl games were played in miserable conditions. In 1947, LSU would meet Arkansas in the Cotton Bowl. In truth, it was more of an ice bowl. The ground was frozen. You couldn't even stand up. It was so cold when we weren't playing, uh, we took the benches and set them afire and tried to keep warm. We ran out of benches and fortunately the game ended. The 1949 Cinderella Tigers charmed fans like no other LSU team before or since as they defeated three conference champions on their way to the Sugar Bowl. Two games that year have come to symbolize that magical season. Gaynell Tinsley played a key role in the famous wet field game against North Carolina. One of the men that kept the, did the field, one of the people who worked on the field, he had gone home. Always in the summertime, we would wet the field in the night before so it would be fine for the ball game, just a good sprinkle. Well, he was, wasn't here that night. He was sick or something, was home, so I asked my manager to go out and water the field after the, they practice that night, after we practice. And he did. The next morning when I get to the stadium about 7 o'clock or 7.30, the man, the caretaker, was out rewatering the field, not knowing that it had been watered the night before. By the way, LSU beat North Carolina 13-7. The regular season wrapped up with the annual showdown against Tulane. The night before the game, some Tiger fans painted their prediction on the Tulane Stadium. LSU 21, Tulane nothing. It seemed ridiculous. Tulane had shut out the Tigers the year before. But the next day, in front of a record crowd of 79,000, LSU pulled the upset of the season. Kenny Conch was the hero, taking a punt back 92 yards for a touchdown. It proved to be the catalyst for, you guessed it, a 21 to nothing victory. Tulane read the writing on the wall. 
The love affair between this team and its fans has always been very clear-cut. Devotion and undying affection. But the relationship between the head coach and the fans, well, it hasn't always been that clear-cut. Paul Dietzel arrived in Baton Rouge in 1954 and led the Tigers to their only national championship. But the simple promise he made to never leave LSU got him in trouble with the fans. 1958 would be Dietzel's finest season. At Alabama, the Crimson Tide controlled the game for nearly a half, but the Tigers were undaunted. Johnny Robinson's TD reception finally put the Tigers in front. Then Billy Cannon scored to put the finishing touches on a 13-3 victory. After the game, even Bear Bryant admitted that team was special. Later that year, Ole Miss came to Baton Rouge, ranked number one in the nation. It would be the first sellout of the expanded Tiger Stadium. An incredible first quarter goal line stand at the south end zone set the tone for the contest. Touchdowns by white team quarterback Warren Rabb and go teamer Durrell Mathern gave the Tigers a 14 to nothing win. LSU's most lopsided win that magical year came in New Orleans in a 62 to nothing romp over Tulane. The game was just six to nothing at the half. But the Tigers flexed their muscle and scored eight touchdowns in the final 30 minutes. They finished the season undefeated. The national title was LSU's and Dietzel's three-team scheme had captured But there was one game left to play. It was on New Year's Day in New Orleans. The Tigers wanted something that day that had eluded LSU teams before, a victory in the Sugar Bowl. Thanks to their great defense and a Billy Cannon nine-yard option pass to Mickey Mangum, they got it, a seven to nothing shutout of Clemson. The play was a halfback pass, which Billy threw, which I had somewhat of a nickname of Iron Hands. Uh, fortunately, I caught it. I'm not sure I caught it with my hands or my elbows, but it was a uh, halfback option pass, and it was open, and he hit me in the end zone, and, and uh, it worked well. Though there was no repeat title, Two of the next three years, the Tigers were bowl bound, and Coach Paul Dietzel called the 1961 team one of his finest. This team won Dietzel's second SEC title and a trip to the Orange Bowl. After a rugged 10 to 7 victory over Ole Miss that year, he talked about the quality of the 61 squad. I hope all of the boys that played on our championship team in 1958 and 59 will forgive me for this statement. But I want you to know that's the greatest victory I think I've ever participated in. I have never been so thrilled about a win or so thrilled with a great bunch of boys as I was tonight. I think they're the most courageous bunch. Uh, it's just un unbelievable how much courage they showed out there tonight. But there was trouble on the home front. Five days after a thorough dismantling of Colorado in the 62 Orange Bowl, Dietzel asked out of his contract and headed to Army as head coach. He had broken his promise to the fans of LSU. 
In Dietzel's place was former defensive assistant Charlie McClendon. The coaching style changed, but the winning ways continued. In 1962, the Tigers roared to a 9-1-1 record. The highlight of the year came in Atlanta against a powerful Georgia Tech squad. To start the second half, Jerry Stovall took the kickoff, faked to Jimmy Field, and headed upfield untouched for a 98-yard kickoff return, all with a broken rib. See, not a person touched me. I didn't have to over, you know, overpower anybody. When you knock that many people down and they give you a hole to run through, then that's, that's much easier. Real fortunate, though, we play on the American field, because if they'd been 110, 120 yards long, wouldn't have been a touchdown. They'd have caught me. <laughs> With the score tied at seven, backup quarterback Lynn Amity drove the Tigers to a winning field goal and kicked it himself. Seven victory. In 1964, the Rebs and the Tigers teamed up for another Halloween night thriller. Ole Miss had dominated until the game's final moments, when an LSU touchdown and a two-point conversion pulled out a narrow 11-10 triumph. It was Charlie Mack's first victory over the Tigers' arch rival. McClendon had been a Dietzel shadow as an assistant. But even after taking over, there were the inevitable comparisons. After all, Dietzel had won a national championship. McClendon would call the 1966 opener against South Carolina his biggest game. It marked the return of Dietzel, now head coach for the Gamecocks. Charlie Mack sorely wanted to win this one. As it turned out, the game never lived up to its hype LSU won it easily, 28 to 12. Perhaps an even tougher assignment awaited the Tigers when they arrived in Dallas for the 1966 Cotton Bowl. In an unlikely matchup, Charlie Mack and the 7-3 Tigers went up against number two ranked Arkansas. Super salesman athletic director Jim Corbett had convinced somebody in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl that the 7-3 Tigers should be invited on New Year's Day to take on the unbeaten and second-ranked Arkansas Razorbacks. Well, Arkansas had won 22 in a row, and as you might imagine, they were very, very heavy favorites. Coach Charlie McClendon remembers that matchup. Well, the height was really kind of unusual. You know, here, they'd won 22 straight ball games, and we came up with the idea that, okay, we bought all red jerseys with white numerals on them and to be victim number 23. So I kind of, for two weeks, I put it to our players, you're victim number 23. They got so sick of seeing 23. <laughs> but there were some big plays that were made for that ball game that uh, uh, really made the big difference. And uh, I've always felt like you have to have some big plays. But I think a couple of ladies from Arkansas kind of helped us out when they came in with their red and white uh, uniforms on and said, well, they did show up. Well, you know, that kind of fired the players up. In fact, that's all I said when we got ready to hit the field. I said, well, I think those ladies said it all. You know, we did show up, so that was good. The Tigers showed up, but it was the Hogs who were led to the slaughter. In the second quarter, little Joe Labruzzo carried five times on a seven-play scoring drive. Moments later, Bill Bass recovered a Razorback fumble, and the same scoring script evolved. It was Labruzzo again, taking it in for the score. In the fourth quarter, Jerry Joseph grabbed an interception, and victory was assured. LSU had triumphed 14 to 7 in one of the biggest upsets in bowl history. One of the most remarkable series in LSU football came not against a traditional foe like Tulane or another SEC powerhouse. It was the Tigers matchup with the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. The series began in 1970 when the Tigers traveled to South Bend to take on a Joe Theismann-led squad. 
LSU's defense set the tone for this deck. On the first play of the game, linebacker Richard Piku promptly separated the football from the receiver. It gave the Irish an early wake-up call. Then Piku caused another fumble and recovered it with the Irish threatened on the Tiger three. Later, with Notre Dame facing fourth and inches near midfield, the defense held again. Although the Tigers eventually lost three to nothing, the game marked the birth of a terrific rivalry. In 1970, the three to nothing loss to Notre Dame was excruciatingly painful, but yet the Tigers went on to win their only SEC championship under Charlie Mack. A key victory took place on a wet, sloppy day at Auburn. LSU was a 13-point underdog to Pat Sullivan and the Tigers. But the Bayou Bengals would not be intimidated. The offense put two touchdowns on the board, and the defense led by All-American Ron Este. Linebacker Richard Piku. And the ever-present Mike Anderson made it stand up. LSU ended Auburn's title hopes by a score of 17 to 9. The following week in Birmingham, the Tigers ran the ball a staggering 62 times, dominating the Crimson Tide. Linebacker Lewis Cassio's interception sealed a 20-15 victory. Charlie McClendon defeated his former coach, Bear Bryant, for the second year in a row. The season-ending victory over Ole Miss was even more gratifying. Archie Manning, who had frustrated Tiger championship hopes for two straight years, was ineffective, playing with a cast on his left arm. Tommy Casanova nearly beat the Rebs all by himself with an interception and two punt returns for touchdowns. When Ron Este caught Archie Manning in the south end zone for a safety, Tiger fans realized the route was on. Final score, LSU 61, Ole Miss 17. The Tigers were once again champions of the SEC. This south end zone has been the scene of some of the greatest defensive struggles in all of college football. In fact, some people say that LSU defenses treat this small piece of real estate, boy, it's almost like a piece of sacred turf. Such was the case when Notre Dame traveled to Baton Rouge in 1971. The entire state was in a tizzy over this return matchup of a year ago. When it was over, the Irish wished they had never left South Bend. Tommy Casanova defended that South End zone as if his life depended on it. Linebacker Warren Capone seemed to be everywhere. Three goal line stands by the Bandits totally frustrated the Irish. On offense, LSU fans witnessed the emergence of Burt Jones. In the first quarter, he found his cousin Andy Hamilton with two completions and a touchdown. LSU football is a tough, stingy defense. But another great tradition is one that changes this place from Tiger Stadium to Death Valley. It's nighttime football in Baton Rouge. It's a documented fact that LSU plays better at night. 
Perhaps it's a little Bayou magic. Or simply, it gives the fans all day to get ready. By watching this party, you think that LSU fans invented tailgating. Side and surrounding Tiger Stadium is unique in college football. They have created an experience for LSU players that is unforgettable. There's no experience like playing in Tiger Stadium. Uh, and I wish every, every LSU fan could do it. There's nothing like running through the, the Golden Band with uh, screaming Tiger fans. There's just no experience like it. And uh, every great Tiger fan, I wish they could have that experience. One of the things that I hear all around the league is about coming to playing in Tiger State. Everybody fears coming in. They think LSU is probably one of the hardest places to come in and play. To get a win is is very it's, it's very tough to do. In 1972, the Tigers played their most memorable night game since the Halloween magic of Billy Cannon. And Ole Miss would be the victim once again. The Tigers had the nation's best quarterback in Burt Jones. Still, late in the fourth quarter, LSU trailed by six. Jones drove the Bengals down the field, battling both the Rebels and the clock. And finally, with four seconds left, he threw for the end zone, but the pass fell incomplete. Ole Miss thought the game was over, but incredibly, there was still one tick left on the clock. Jones went to the sidelines to confer with Coach Charlie Mack. Uh, it was an exciting time. Neither one of us were conversing a whole lot at that point. I think our nerves had probably come to a frown. Story. Here is the game over. Jones back to throw, looking for a receiver. He has Davis. It is good for the For the last play of the game, Brad Davis gets a bird goes fast in the corner of the end zone. And pandemonium breaks loose at Tiger Stadium as the Tigers eke out a 17 to 16 victory over the Ole Miss Rebels. After the game, you could drive into Mississippi and see signs that read, set your clocks back four seconds. You're leaving Louisiana and coming into Mississippi. LSU enjoyed many tremendous wins with Charlie McClendon at the helm. But in his last year of coaching, he would endure what he called the worst call he ever saw in football and it would cost the team a huge win. It came against Southern Cal in 1979. The Trojans were ranked number one, but a touchdown pass from Steve Ensminger to Leroy Jones had the Tigers up 12 to three at the half. Sparked by Heisman Trophy winner Charles White, the Trojans came back and cut the lead to 12 to 10. LSU had apparently held on to win when they stopped USC on this play, but there was a flag down. To the dismay of the Tiger fans, the officials called a face mask on LSU, and with no That is a tough one. This was one Probably we shouldn't have been on the same football team with them. They had a good football team. But that night, we were as good as they were. And I think this is what was so disappointing that we felt like we outplayed USC that night. And not only did I see my players cry, but their coach cried as well because they gave everything they had. They had nothing left. But, you know, we felt like we got a real tough call in our own stadium, the Tiger Stadium but it could have been the difference in the ball game. In Charlie McClendon's last year as head coach at LSU, his team went seven and five and captured still another bowl victory. But it's all said and done, he is now the winningest head coach in LSU football history. He is indeed a Golden Tiger.
In 1982, under coach Jerry Stovall, LSU had an impressive offensive arsenal featuring quarterback Alan Risher and running backs Dalton Hilliard and Gary James. Perhaps the biggest win of the year was a 20 to 10 romp over Alabama at Legion Field, the first win over Bama since 1970. The Tigers out hustled and out hit the tide for all 60 minutes. It was a pounding like Bear Bryant had seldom seen. And after the game, he made a point of saying that directly to Coach Stovall. He said, uh, Jerry, that's the, uh, that's the best blankety blank, uh, blank, blank kicking that we've gotten in a long time here at Alabama. And I said, Coach, do you mind if I share that with my team? And he said, well, I, I'll come into your locker room and tell them myself. And I said, no, sir, if you don't mind, I'd rather tell them. So he did, I told the kids, I said, look, you, I'm fixing to give you the highest compliment I think you can get from perhaps the greatest coach that will ever coach this game has just said you did a marvelous job. And uh, that, that's a compliment to the assistant coaches and to our players. Have Coach Bryant say that about them, I thought was perhaps the best thing that could possibly happen to them. Two weeks later, the Bowl Scouts descended on Baton Rouge for the showdown between Florida State and LSU. Games with the Seminoles tend to be exciting, and this one was no exception. With Saturday night magic in the air, the Tigers struck quickly with a touchdown pass to Dalton Hilliard. Already, the oranges were flying as LSU would earn a bid to the Orange Bowl with a victory this night. Just before halftime, Eric Martin and the Bengals broke the game wide open. With the fog rolling in off the bayou, and the Tigers scoring touchdown after touchdown, the second half turned into a 55 to 21 blowout. It was a night never to be forgotten. Chancellor Warden, on behalf of the Orange Bowl Committee, it's my extreme pleasure to extend to you on behalf of this great university, LSU, an invitation to play the Big Eight champion in the Orange Bowl on January 1st. <laughs> The 1982 turned out to be the most rewarding year in Jerry Stovall's coaching career, earning him National Coach of the Year honors. Two years later, LSU was under the direction of Bill Arnsbart, who took the Tigers back to the top of the SEC standings. Arnsbarger's greatest talent was getting the most out of his Tigers in hostile environments against the giants of college football. In 1984, he took his team to the Los Angeles Coliseum to meet Southern Cal. Led by quarterback Jeff Wickersham, the Bengals knocked off the Trojans on their home turf 23-3. That same year at a soggy Legion field, the Tigers battled Alabama. Thanks to the running of Dalton Hilliard and a blocked punt by Michael Brooks, the Tigers drowned the Crimson Tide 16 to 14. This time, LSU embarrassed the Irish at home, defeating Notre Dame 10-7 on a cold winter day in Indiana. Man, 
line in motion. Woodside going to the far side. Murray back to throw. Three-man rush. He's got a lot of time. He's down by Carl Wilson. Back at the 37-yard line. In 1986, the SEC was perhaps the most powerful conference in America. LSU would be its most dominant team. Four weeks into the year, it appeared the Tigers were on the right track. A 28-17 victory at Gainesville was a tremendous confidence builder. A week later, Georgia fell 23-14, and the Tigers were undefeated in the conference. Still, the team who wins in November is the team that will win it all. On November the 8th, the Tigers travel to Birmingham to face off with Alabama. It was an old-fashioned test of character in the SEC. In the end, it was Alabama that flinched. So, puts it out there, and it is touchdown! The Tigers scored an emotional 14 to 10 victory that put them just one win away from the SEC title. A week later, LSU made it look easy, defeating Mississippi State 47 to nothing. The SEC title was assured. the matter of Notre Dame. On November the 22nd, the Tigers were playing for the pride of LSU and the conference in the final meeting in a series with Notre Dame that had begun in 1970. It was another nail biter, complete with a classic goal line stand at the south end zone. LSU prevailed 21-19. In 1988, the Tigers would win their second SEC title in three years. The game that set the stage for their dramatic championship run took place early in the year under the spell of the night sky in Death Valley. You know, the excitement of football can take on many different forms. There's the exhilaration of a high-scoring offensive game or the tension of a close defensive struggle. Well, such was the case in 1988 as Auburn came to town to take on LSU. SEC title hopes on the line. And at that evening, the heat and humidity had a lot in common with the stifling defenses that both teams were playing. Auburn had denied LSU a point all night long. Well, LSU had yielded only a pair of field goals. With time running out in the game, the purple and gold mounted a drive to destiny. Hudson back to throw under pressure. Has his tight end Halliburton. Can he get the first down? He can't. LSU moved to the Auburn 10-yard line, but a pass into the end zone on third down fell incomplete. This nail-biter had come down to a final do-or-die play. With the cool of a riverboat gambler, Tommy Hodson brought the team to the line. 1.47 to go in the game. LSU wins or loses on this play, it would appear. David Brown Dyke's conversion, LSU had won 
The eruption that ensued in the stadium literally shook the earth, causing tremors that were picked up in LSU's geology department. A lot of schools can brag about their brand of football, but where else can fans and athletes alike cause such a commotion that the earth actually moves? Games in 1991 and 92 saw the Tigers roar again as LSU began a rebuilding process. In 1991, a late fumble on the goal line caused by Ricardo Washington against Vanderbilt and a 76-yard return by Wayne Williams gave new head coach Curly Haldman his first victory in Death Valley. A stunning 24-3 upset of Mississippi State a year later sparked by an emotional LSU defense was reminiscent of the traits that had led to greatness for teams from Doc Fenton to Billy Cannon and Burt Jones. For years to come, LSU fans will continue to savor these golden moments in Tigerland. College football in the 1990s bears little resemblance to the game of 100 years ago. But the young men who follow in these heroes' footsteps share a common goal, a desire to be the best, to play with honor and courage, and to bring credit and glory to LSU.